Hello and welcome to Global Health TV. Today we'll be looking at the relationship between nutrition and mental health. Our understanding of the impact food can have on the brain is changing. It's becoming more apparent that food can trigger the same neural effect as seen in addiction. To discuss this emerging field, I spoke to Dr. Ashley Gearhart at the 2023 annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Gearhart runs a food addiction science and treatment lab at the University of Michigan and was attending the conference to present evidence that food addiction may be a valid diagnosis. Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for coming to talk to us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Let's kick off. What is food addiction? So what we think of when we say food addiction is that we hypothesize that really highly processed, rewarding foods can trigger all the key indicators of an addictive substance use disorder, like we see with alcohol and nicotine. And so how we conceptualize this is we apply the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for substance use disorders to the intake of foods like chocolate and ice cream and potato chips. And we see that about 14% of adults and 12% of children would qualify for a substance use disorder if the substance you were looking at was highly processed food. What effect does this have on people who are addicted to these foodstuffs? Yeah, what we see for people who seem to show those addiction profiles is that it really does feel like their relationship with food um, is very toxic for them and that it's compulsive. And even if they want to stop or they're having health conditions that suggest they really need to change their diet, they find that they can't. And our research finds that this addictive profile predicts um, a worse treatment response to our traditional approaches to trying to help people lose weight or eat healthier. And that people who meet for this addictive profile with their highly processed food intake have a lower quality of life across every single domain. So this is really a group of people who are clinically suffering that right now, because this isn't a diagnostic category in our, our manual, we're kind of missing the assessment and identification of these people. I imagine a lot of these conditions feed into each other, don't they, as well, because of obesity yeah. and uh, a lot of different other conditions. Absolutely, you're right. So we see that if we look at someone who is maybe has um, a body mass index in the normal weight range, it's about 7% of people would meet for this food addiction profile. If we look at individuals with obesity, it goes up to about one in three. Right. And when we look at um, the association with something like, let's say, type 2 diabetes, right. it is incredibly highly linked and at sometimes sixfold is high risk of type 2 diabetes for people with this addiction profile. And we also see that there's a lot of um, high risk substance use that can also co-occur. So just like we see with things like gambling or people can, uh, who are at risk for drinking might also be at risk for smoking or using cannabis in a risky way, we see that there also might be this clustering of risky, highly processed food intake for people who are showing addictions in other realms. What's the role for a psychiatrist here? Yes, so a role for a psychiatrist, I think in large part, um, you know, the psychiatric community plays such an important part in helping us conceptualize and identify clinically significant conditions. And I think the science has been emerging to a point where we really need to ask ourselves whether there's time to, at least in a provisional way, start to um, codify and investigate and diagnose this to help improve the science and improve treatment. I just think psychiatry has a lot to say and to bear on different addiction-focused treatments, whether that's pharmacology or psychobiological treatments that we have developed in the realm of addictive disorders, um, like naltrexone, like bupropren, that might really also be applicable to this large group of individuals who are currently really struggling to um, change their relationship with food. Does this also lead to greater health inequity? Yes, so we see that our modern food supply is wildly unequal and that for communities of color, for people who are under-resourced, that uh, it's not just that they live in food deserts where they can't access healthy food, but they live in food swamps where they're aggressively targeted to and marketed for these highly processed foods. And it's on every corner and the queues and the drive throughs and the bodegas are, are really just drenched in these foods. And we see this really starts even in childhood that, you know, 
people who have food insecurity and don't have enough money in their families to eat um, food every month in a sustainable way, that that is associated with an increased risk of developing this addictive eating profile. Um, because you're really reliant on something that might be addictive to just get your daily needs met. Nobody gets to opt out of eating. And so when the um, environment is so incredibly imbalanced and um, structurally unfair, uh, we do see that this has really important social justice implications. It doesn't seem to me like it's a fair contest here, does it? Because you've got, you've got a poorer people, as you've described, yes. and you've got these huge corporations who, you know, who, uh, yeah. who are anything but. So what, what can actually be done to help people? Yes, so I think one of the things that I think is most important is really kind of taking this science that has been building um, seriously. I would say when I talk to uh, the public, and we ask, you know, oh, do you think highly processed foods can be addictive? There's like a, of course they can. <laughs> you know, like they're, they're not shocked. When we engage with scientific communities, there's a lot of controversy around this idea. And again, to me, that really harkens back to what we saw with tobacco. We right. spent decades arguing over whether it was just a bad habit or whether it was addictive. Now we, you know, cigarettes are highly addictive, killing, you know, more people than alcohol and stimulants combined. And we, we really, took a long time to take that seriously and to treat it in that way. And so I think really considering whether these novel, highly rewarding foods are truly addictive and are diminishing our ability to make choices in our best interest is important. I think, um, I really think of this very much from a public health perspective, that we know treatment is key and getting people access to good empirically supported treatment is important. And we want to live in an environment that actually makes it likely that our treatments can work. And that as we saw with tobacco, things like restricting marketing to children, um, limiting access through things like vending machines, um, thinking about zoning regulations, that changing the environment so it really promotes nourishing healthy relationships with food rather than you know just profits and uh, dietary disease. We really need to think um, in an upstream policy systematic way and I think psychiatric and mental health communities can really advocate for the need for those changes. Thank you very much. My Thank pleasure. you for joining us. Thank you. Now we're all broadly aware of the link between diet and physical health, especially for diseases like type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease, but less is understood about the contribution by diet to mental health. At the recent American Psychiatric Association meeting in San Francisco, California, I spoke to Dr. Bhagwan Baru, a practicing psychiatrist from Arlington, Virginia, about our complex relationship with food and its impact on our mental health. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you for having me here today. How does food affect uh, mental health? Well, it's an interesting concept. We always think of medications and even drugs sold on the street, the so-called illicit drugs, affecting our mind. We never contemplate or understand that food is the same thing as the other medications and drugs. They go through the same system, they affect the same organs in the body, hence they affect in either a positive or a negative manner. So listening to you speak, one would think that this is quite a big issue then. I would certainly say so. I am convinced it's a very big issue because down the years our diets have changed. If we look at the diets of uh, our ancestors from the Paleolithic era, 10,000 years ago, they definitely did not recognize any of the foods that we eat today. The hunter-gatherers first and then the farmers. Food diets changed. It became more carbohydrate-oriented. And after that, the last 200 years, with the industrialization of the nations, as well as the advent of TV dinners and fast food concepts, our diets have most certainly changed and not all for the good. So it's a quite a new area in nutritional psychiatry. What got you interested in it? I have always been interested in psychiatry as a discipline and nutrition as part of me. As they say, you are what you eat. And coming from a traditional Indian home, being raised by parents who firmly believed in good, solid nutrition and home-cooked cooking, home-meat cooking. 
so much so that we do, of course, went out for eating, but most foods were home cooked. Not only that, as I grew up, I stayed with that concept, went to medical school, learned more about nutrition. In those days, in the 70s, biochemistry and nutrition were part and parcel of study. Today, the medical profession has divorced nutrition from the curriculum. As such, it has, it's a shame that it has happened, but that's the price we pay for modern progress. My wife joined me in life and she continued the same tradition, the home cooked tradition. And now with my son and his wife and the grandkids, we all still do the same. So to make it easier, bottom line is, we have to have a balance in life, a balance of what we must eat and what we sometimes are tempted to eat. So is this an issue, is this a, a, a Western world issue? Is this an issue where of more, too much convenience food, too much, you know, too many carbohydrates? I would say it may have started in the Western world, but every time I visit the Eastern world, I see the pattern almost becoming more and more similar. It is now, I think, a global phenomenon where everyone on this planet in one way or the other is affected by it. What role does food addiction have with this? Now, food addiction is a complex concept, and I think it comes well under the umbrella of nutritional psychiatry. When we grow up, we always have this concept of comfort foods, foods that make us happy. Some people are happy with a donut. Other people enjoy potato chips. So every person does not have the same concept of comfort food. And then many a times there are psychological and psychiatric conditions that induce us secondarily to become malnourished and start having more and more affinity for some unhealthy foods. They could be either too much or too little. Either one is bad. And do you think this is a global problem? It is. And it has to be handled on a much bigger, larger scale than it is being now. The availability of foods is not universally the same everywhere in the world. Besides, there are different seasons in different parts where foods are available and not. We fortunately live in a country where foods are imported and we have most of the items all over, from all over the world, whether they are South American or Australian or Asian. There is a silver lining though that I see. In the last couple of decades, I've seen a change in what is available for the better. I find more varieties of fruits and vegetables, the healthy ones, available more often than not, than they were in the past. What's the role of the psychiatrist in all this? Psychiatrist has a very important role because every person who visits a psychiatrist clinic should be given proper nutrition. As soon as the psychiatrist and his team sit down to write an individualized treatment plan, I would advocate them not to just concentrate on medications and meditation as well as therapies, but at the same time give due consideration to asking the patient what are the foods they eat and how can they be done more modified, more improved, such that it benefits them rather than harms them. It sounds to me like a very good idea. Do you think well, what needs to be done to enable psychiatrists to do this? Because at the moment, one could argue that's not the role of a psychiatrist. I beg to disagree. A psychiatrist is a doctor. As a physician, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that all aspects of health are addressed and if we leave nutrition behind in our discussion with the patients, then we are actually doing a disservice. I am not against medications. I am not against therapies. Those are great fields and they've evolved down the years. We have the best possible treatments available. Yet, if we do not include a discussion about what could be improved as far as their daily diet is concerned, then I think it's an incomplete treatment plan. How much of this is down to modern food production methods? Very, very true. The 
modern food production methods have come to a point where we have gotten so used to fast foods, processed foods, and now there's a new term, ultra processed foods. All these foods, while they are temptingly palatable and tasty, they don't provide the same nutrition which is provided by the healthier variety of vegetables, fruits, grains. As such, while they are easy and convenient, TV dinners and fast food, I am not against them, but they should be done in moderation. And as much as possible, as far as we can do, we should do home cooked meals, which are definitely more nutritious because we control what we put in them. And I'm not against spices and sugar and salt and all the other good things which make foods more palatable, but everything in moderation and paying attention to the fact that we are getting all the basic requirements in a good daily diet. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. It's fascinating stuff, so thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me here today. That's all for this episode of Global Health TV. Next time, we'll be looking at how our brains could age better, changing cultural attitudes to psychedelics and climate change and mental health, with more experts at the American Psychiatric Association meeting. Until then, it's goodbye.